Reminder for Home and Away fans, you can see today's episode this afternoon at 4.35. Right now, the story of Robert. This is Alton, Illinois. Located at the southwest end of the state, along the Mississippi River. The town is often described as a nice, quiet place to live. Even though new businesses are continuing the growth of the economy, much of Alton remains relatively unaffected. Preferring instead to retain the quaintness and slower pace of years gone by. It was here during February of 1918, while the world was concerning itself with the war in Europe, an unnoticed but joyful event occurred for Harold and Addie Wadlow, the birth of their first child, a son who they proudly named Robert Pershing. Virtually from the moment of his birth, the boy grew and grew and grew and grew until he had become the tallest person ever to set foot on the face of the earth. Robert is no longer with us, having died prematurely at the age of 22 back in 1940 and is buried here in the Upper Alton Cemetery. He lies beside his father, Harold, and one of his brothers, Eugene. The comparatively plain but tasteful headstone states merely that Robert is at rest. But even in death, Robert P. Wadlow stands out among those around him. Robert Wadlow was born on February 22, 1918, in this house. The attending physician assured his anxious parents that their son was a perfectly normal, healthy, eight and a half pound baby. By the age of six months, young Robert attained a weight of 30 pounds. At 18 months, he gained to 67 pounds. By the time he was five, when his mother took him to school for the first time, he had reached a height of five feet one inch, towering above his classmates. In the third grade, he stood taller than his teacher. To the people of Upper Alton, Robert was looked upon and thought of like any other youngster his age. He engaged in normal adolescent activities, such as running a lemonade stand in front of his home and playing with other children in the neighborhood. I didn't even know there was such a person as Robert Wadlow till one day I was out in the yard and here was this ridiculous scene right across the street on the sidewalk. There was this little red wagon going along with a great big man in it. He had his knee up in the wagon and his foot down behind just to pushing his wagon along. And I thought, what a silly person would that be? So I went in and told my mother and she came and looked and that's when I heard. Robert Wadlow had moved across the street, and it really wasn't a man at all. It was just a little boy. He was enrolled here at Milton Elementary School for his early education. I'm Robert Wadlow, 12 years old, and I weigh 240 pounds, and I'm, way, I'm about seven feet tall. Uh, these boys grouped around me are about the same age as I am. They go to the same grade. Uh, I like to... Uh, I play baseball, basketball, and football. When I grow up, I hope to be a big man like Lindy if I can get a plane big enough. Look out, here it comes. It was very difficult for us to think of Robert as just another pupil. Although he did uh, play and act like the other children. Yet the fact uh, remained that he was so much larger and bigger than the others and uh, this put him at a disadvantage like um, fitting into the desk. Uh, as I recall he was a good student uh, he made good grades got along very nicely with the fellow students 
very polite and ambitious young boy. In the late 1920s, the word giant became very much in evidence. Not because of Robert, but through the introduction of a mammoth heavyweight prize fighter from Italy named Primo Canera. Shown here, fighting a six feet one inch, 200 pound opponent, Canera awed the sporting public with his tremendous size. Standing six feet five and three quarter inches and weighing 265 pounds, he was the subject of much ballyhoo and publicity. He was continually being shown with smaller men to exaggerate his height. In 1930, he signed for a fight in St. Louis. The promoter thought it would help the gate receipts to pose him with Robert Wadlow. Canera, who was very proud of his size, could see no harm in posing for photographs with a mere child. This decision proved to be of great personal embarrassment to Canera. There he stood, in a few short years to become the largest heavyweight boxing champion of all time, yet he was still four inches shorter than the 12-year-old boy from Alton. That same year, Robert was taken to Barnes Medical Hospital in St. Louis to determine the cause for his fantastic growth. The reason was that Robert's pituitary gland, located in the base of the brain, had become overactive. The pituitary, much like the better known thyroid gland, directly relates to the size and growth of an individual. The possibility of corrective surgery was discussed and decided against. The reasons were basically twofold. First, the boy experienced no physical or mental difficulty, being normally proportioned for his size and having proved to have a higher than average IQ. Secondly, the seriousness of such an operation could have resulted in permanent injury or death. So Robert returned to Alton and continued to live a normal life. At the age of 13, he joined the Boy Scouts of America and the local YMCA. While attending summer camp, he tried to blend in with the other boys. However, now being able to casually lean on a camp house roof as if it were a fireplace mantle, it was difficult at best not to be noticed. Going on to junior and senior high school, which were both located here, Robert continued to grow. Everyone who ever saw him at school remembered him. This big blonde fellow with the blue eyes was easy to blush. The boys liked to tease him sometimes, and he always took it so well. But in spite of everything, his ears would turn red, and he would chuckle, and he would look terribly embarrassed. But I never did see him appear angry, and he seemed very kind. He didn't seem at all perturbed with life as it was. I didn't even think to be sympathetic to him. I was a young person, too. He just was another young person who happened to be tall. I did my student teaching at Alton High School, and one day I was drafted into teaching in Robert's room. I, d I don't remember the occasion anymore, but I went in there to teach, and I still don't remember a single thing I taught, because when Robert walked in there and sat down with those great big old feet sticking out, I kept looking at him, and he got out his paper, and he put it on the desk. It was a regular notebook-sized paper, he put that great big hand on top to start writing, and I couldn't see the paper anymore. He had a, a pencil. I walked back, actually, to see. It was really a full-size pencil, but it looked like just a little stub, and here he was writing with this little stub on this little bitty piece of paper that to anybody else would have been a big one. What I taught him, I don't know. <laughs> Over the years, it was rather difficult for me to explain the reason why a boy the size of Robert we didn't use in uh, basketball. He wanted to play, but uh, we were scared to use him because we were afraid that uh, he would get hurt. Uh, our idea was, was to get a pair of basketball shoes and uh, fit him, and as we went, as a team to various schools why uh, 
we would take him along, but uh, we had difficulty in uh, getting shoes for, to fit him, <laughs> naturally, and by the time we got shoes, why, the season was over. Having had to drop out of school for a half a year because of a foot infection, Robert quickly made up for the lost credits and graduated from Alton High School in January of 1936. It required 14 square yards of cloth to make his cap and gown. Robert was to be the tallest person ever to graduate from high school. He stood an incredible eight feet, three and a half inches. After graduation, Robert enrolled in Shirtliff College. Rich in history and tradition, as well as being located in Alton, Shirtliff was the logical school to attend for furthering his education. Robert's ultimate goal was to receive a degree, then go on to law school. Even though he maintained good grades, the icy walkways caused by the cold Illinois winters made walking from building to building very difficult as well as dangerous. He was just a growing boy. His mischievousness was just like any other. He'd take your hat and put it up in the chandeliers where you couldn't get a hold of it. Uh, and once in a while, he'd get, had to get scorched, but uh, nothing ever come of it. But uh, Robert, uh, to the people in Alton, I think, was just uh, another fellow. People from out of town would give him a second glance, of course, but uh, he was just a regular boy, like any other boy, only larger, and just a citizen of Alton. After only one semester, he decided to leave school and devote his energies to that of the world of business. When I first became acquainted with Robert Wadlow, his dad had brought him into our company to have shoes made for him. They were so large that they had to have special lasts, and it turned out that even at that young age, he wore a size 27 shoe. We did not attempt to uh, do anything to promote Robert, although his dad was interested in having us do so in a moderate way. So the only thing we really did for quite a few years was to make a poster showing his picture and giving his measurements and sending out a single shoe to stores to put in their window because they did attract a lot of attention. We then asked, told his dad that we would like to sign him up for a long-term contract. By this time, his shoe size had grown to 37 and a half. It was my job to decide what we, how we could best use it. In the mid to 1930s, I traveled with Robert Guadalow his, and his dad, Harold, as a field representative for Peter Shoe Company of St. Louis. When we came into a town, I would immediately contact the merchant and find out whether we were to exhibit Robert on the outside or inside of the store. Mr. Wadlow himself would then make a 10 to 15 minute talk about Robert and his phenomenal growth, after which we would leave the store and the merchant would then transact business with those who had gathered to see Robert. I rarely found him angry at any time. The only time that he really did get angry was when we were walking in a crowd, he having one hand on his dad's shoulder, the other on mine, and then someone would come up behind and pinch him in the leg or kick him in the shins to see whether or not he was walking on his own legs or on stilts. Walking became an ordeal for Robert as he grew older because of his immense feet. He would more or less throw them rather than move them forward in walking as you and I would normally do. 
about the only problem that we had with Robert was when coming into a small hotel and going to our rooms, Robert would go down the hall, stoop down and look in the transoms of the rooms adjacent to his. And it was necessary for Harold and I to kind of nudge him along so that we did not annoy other people. Robert's life was clean. He never looked on the seedy side. And he is, was a type of boy that any mother or dad would be proud to call their own. Robert's home life always remained a personal and private matter. His parents were careful to see that his upbringing was as normal as possible. Robert had four younger brothers and sisters, Eugene, Helen, Betty, and Harold Jr., all of whom matured to normal size. There are no instances prior to or since Robert's birth in any segment of his family showing a growth pattern such as his. Robert's birthdays were always special occasions for the family. On those events, they would make some personal appearances and be photographed. At all other times, both then and today, their collective desire for privacy has been respected. Even though his travels took him all over the country, Robert was always anxious to return home to Alton so he could be with his family. He maintained an interest in local affairs and participated in as many activities as possible. Being a member of the youth-oriented Demolay Society gave Robert a great deal of personal satisfaction. After his 21st birthday, the maximum age limit to remain a member, a special ceremony was given in his honor for the work he had done representing the ideals of the organization. Shortly thereafter, he applied for and was accepted into the Franklin Masonic Temple. Whereas most men's ring sizes range from that of eight and a half to size 13, Robert's specially made ring measured an unbelievable size 25. This was the largest in the lodge's history and became one of his most prized personal possessions. We at the lodge were very pleased to have Robert become a member. We had known Robert for quite a number of years. Being the tremendous height that he was, it was very difficult for him to uh, carry on a normal conversation or sit in any of the chairs or with our meetings going on. So uh, what we did, we had a regular special chair built for him that he could uh, sit in and uh, be comfortable. It is only when one a normal person sits in a chair do you get the real physical awareness of how big a man Bob really was. I was graduated from the University of Missouri in the summer of 1939, and my first job was with the International Shoe Company, the Peters Branch Division, and I was assigned to traveling with Robert Wadlow, the world's tallest man, and his father, Harold Wadlow. And one of the things we incorporated in our little show was that we put a silver dollar on top of Robert's head. Now, we knew that it would take a man six foot ten just to reach that silver dollar. And although no one actually reached it, you know, Robert had a way of stretching when he wanted to, uh, even if they didn't reach it, we would still give him the silver dollar because naturally we didn't want to embarrass him and also we, we felt it was good public relations. Robert was a very neat, clean person. Uh, like, for example, many times when we'd go out getting ready for an appearance, Robert would call me over and ask me if his tie was clean, if his shirt had any spots on it. And I'd always inspect him and say, Robert, you're okay, you're all set. And he'd, he'd feel good about it because he, he realized the importance of a, of a clean, personal image. 
Robert had a genuine interest in children. Uh, whenever we would travel, even though we had a very busy day, Robert was never too busy to find time for children. We'd go to schools and orphanages, and we'd talk to the children. Robert would pat him on the head, put him on his knee, and he was always just thrilled to be with the youngsters, would give them autographs, and he was never too busy to be with the kids. Now, one of the things uh, a lot of people didn't know about Robert was that he, he was interested in women. He liked women, and he enjoyed being with them. And like, for example, we, we did go out on double dates. We'd go to a theater or a nightclub, usually for dinner and then dancing, and we'd have a nice meal, and his sense of humor was tremendous. We laughed, we giggled, we, we just had a wonderful time. And Robert w would love ice cream. He made have a milkshake, uh, and he enjoyed milkshakes. Even out at a nightclub, he, would, uh, he wouldn't be ashamed to ask for a milkshake. And he would have a good meal, eat no more than anyone else, and the girls just enjoyed it. And, uh, and Robert never took advantage of being uh, a popular person and one that was in the limelight. He never uses popularity to take advantage of anyone. On June 27, 1940, Robert kept what proved to be the last of his regularly scheduled visits to Barnes Hospital. At that time, his height was measured at an incredible 8 feet 11.9 inches, while weighing a comparatively light 439 pounds. This measurement gave irrefutable evidence that Robert was the tallest person in the history of man. Even more amazing was the fact that he was still growing. On June 29, 1940, we started a planned tour of the northern and northeastern part of the United States. And on July 4th, we were up in Manistee, Michigan for the National Forest Festival. Uh, for a few days now, we, Robert had complained he hadn't been feeling so well, but we didn't think too much of it, and we just kept working the normal way. And as we appeared in this parade, uh, Robert's father came to me about 2 o'clock in the afternoon and mentioned that he didn't think Robert should continue any longer, that he just wasn't feeling well. So naturally, there was nothing to do, so we maneuvered our way out of the parade, and we returned to the hotel, and the first thing we did was call a doctor. After the doctor examined Robert, it was explained to us that a brace on his left shoe, which had just been adjusted prior to our trip, had been rubbing against his ankle, causing an infection. Uh, ten days later, uh, after minor surgery and blood transfusions and running temperatures of 106 degrees, uh, Robert passed away. And this was on, in the early morning hours of July 15, 1940, in Manistee, Michigan, at the Chippewa Hotel. And so Robert Wadlow was laid to rest. With the passage of time, the memory of Robert has, for the most part, dimmed to the point where he is now placed as a footnote in history or is included in stories about other persons such as himself. But to the people of Alton and those who knew him, he is still very much with them and is held in a special place in their hearts. They liked him for who he was, not what he was. To outsiders, he was something to be marveled at. To others, he was just Robert Wadlow, a friend who happened to be taller than everyone else. For the most part, he took all the stares, the gawks, and the insensitive questioning in a typically good-natured way. He was the first to accept a good laugh on himself and would joke about his size. But there was a serious side to Robert the feelings and emotions of a person who, being of above average and in intelligence, developed a philosophy and outlook on people and life in general that a person of a more normal size would not be able to conceive or appreciate, but should be made aware of. I've gotten used to being stared at. Some people may say unkind things, of course. I thought it over long ago and decided to ignore them. The worst thing you can say about them is that they are thoughtless. I would like to be like everyone else. No, I don't want my little brother to be as big as I am. 
You'll have more fun if he isn't. Very early in life, Robert's parents had to make a real decision as to whether or not they would have an operation performed and possibly lose their boy or let nature take its course. And being religiously inclined, they decided to let nature take its course. The result was Robert. The way I remember Robert is, of course, tall, but very blonde with light hair and blue eyes and a fair complexion, a quiet person. But the most outstanding thing about him, as I recall him now, is that he had such a pleasant smile. I really can't recall seeing him without this pleasant smile on his face. I liked him very much.